Sorry. Good morning. Welcome to Community Christian Church. We uh, gather every week at this time to remember what happened uh, to Jesus, that his body was broken for us and his blood was shed. And, and now in times past, we used to have this time as well. We would pass communion trays and we would pass the offering as well. Uh, obviously, we haven't been doing that for a while, but we have been so blessed by the generosity of, of you. And uh, we thank you for that. And obviously, if you don't know, there's the blue buckets there right next to the communion. Uh, so it's a, an opportunity to extend your worship through uh, your, your tithes and offerings. And, and we just thank you so much for your uh, generosity that we've seen over this past year or more. And so, um, so we gather at this time, we remember what happened to Jesus, that his body was broken for us. Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Take and drink this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and this time to gather in your house and around your table to remember what you did for us. And for that, we are so thankful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Community Christian Church. I feel fine. I sound a little different. I sound a little different. So, we, uh, you know, there's certain words that sometimes get tossed around in church and, and in church circles or whatever that, that sometimes uh, we lose the meaning of and, and we don't know the, the, the power that's behind some of these words. And so, we're going to spend the next couple weeks on a series. Um, it's it's a, uh, a sermon series by Kyle Eidelman that's been turned into a book, been turned into a small group study. Uh, it is actually available on Right Now Media if you wanted to check it out. Great, great stuff from him. But anyway, today we're talking about grace <clears throat> and how grace is greater than our mistakes. Sometimes so many of us, the, a lie we buy into is that I've done too much, I've seen too much, God can't use me, I, I, I'm all used up, and, uh, and, and nothing could be more further from the truth. And so I, I would say there's words from 2020 that uh, I, I would love to see go away. Um, you know, it's the, the, the new normal, the social distancing, having to wear mask and on and on and on, all kinds of words that uh, we had to hear in 2020 that were like, because oh, it's changed so many things. And so instead of dwelling on those words, I was like, let me look up some old words that are kind of made up, but, but words that uh, are, are just kind of, you know, different. And, and so these are just kind of meaningless words. Uh, the first one is a non-versation. This is like a word of the year from like Urban Dictionary, non-versation. Many of us, we, we get caught in non-versation sometimes. It's a meaningless conversation of small talk. Sometimes you just can't help it, especially around the holidays. We see people we haven't seen in a while, and we're like, it's a non-versation, just meaningless small talk. Another one is, uh, this is a hard one, <clears throat> unkeyboardinated, unable to type a sentence without an error. Another one, some of you might struggle with this, phonesia. Phonesia. Uh, at first I thought, Forgetting where you put your phone, That's, that happens to me a lot. I don't know if that happens to anybody else. But no, it's actually, phonesia is calling somebody, and while the phone is ringing, you're like, who did I call again and why? Like, I can't remember. I don't know if anybody ever struggles with that. Here's a fun one, disconfect. Disconfect. It's an attempt to clean up candy or food you dropped on the floor just by blowing on it. Five-second rule, right? Another one is called intoxication. It's a tax fund euphoria. Uh, it's that wonderful feeling when you get your tax return until you realize it's your money. They're just giving it back to you. <clears throat> and so we hear these words and we understand some of these words and their definition. But today I want to approach this word grace like maybe it's the first time you've heard it. Years ago there was this uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes commercial campaign that they wanted they, they did a study that realized uh, a lot of people used to eat Kellogg's Corn Flakes, but they, they've kind of quit eating it. And so they, they wanted to say, try it again for the first time. And so today, that's kind of the idea is, hey, we want you to hear and, and reapproach this word grace, maybe like it's the first time. And so many of us, we've heard it, we've used it, uh, but we've maybe missed the power of it. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, the Hebrew writer says, look after each other so that no one fails to receive the grace of God. And so on the topic of grace, don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is important. Don't miss what this says. I know some of us, we maybe struggle with certain things in the Bible, the history and who did what and, you know, who was Gideon and, and, and what did Joshua do? And uh, was it Moses or Noah with the Ten Commandments? I, you know, we might mix some of those things up and that happens. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. And so when we do miss this, unfortunately, things can turn toxic. And if you need a visual display of that, you could probably just spend about five minutes on social media and mission accomplished. You can see how toxic things can be. You can see how ungraceful people can be. It can get really ugly really quick. And so grace is something we need. Uh, we need it because we have sin. We have all sin. 
thankfully, Jesus has taken care of it. Romans 3.23 says, For some have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No, not some. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means me and that means you. We have all sinned and we have fallen short of God's glorious standard. And so that's a problem. That means we can't earn our way into heaven because we're not good enough. We're not holy enough. But the good news is, He's given us a chance to be washed clean and to be able to enter in. I don't know how some of you react when you're, you get sick. I think some of us have different uh, reactions. You know, for some men, they, the man cold is very real. And it, it rocks us and shakes us to our core. But then, of course, women, sometimes they just find a way to handle it tremendously better. You know, powering through and ignoring the sickness, that isn't always the best strategy. I mean, sometimes you can maybe eventually get better, but sometimes there's things that, that need and require medicine in order to feel better and to get better. And so we have a sickness. We believe sin is that sickness. And we believe acknowledging it is a great step uh, to, to being able to accept the medicine that is offered through grace. And so <clears throat> Romans 6.23 the wages of sin is death. Now, for some of us, we get paid every week, every two weeks, twice a month. When the job is done, that's when we get paid. Um, it's just different for, for different people. And so what, what Paul is saying in Romans 6 here is, at the end, the, the tab adds up. And there, there at the total, at the bottom of the bill, it says, somebody's got to pay for this. Okay? Somebody, somebody has to, to die for this bill. There's too, too much here. But luckily, Jesus is willing to foot that bill for us. He's willing to, to pay up for us. Uh, my oldest brother, years ago, had direct TV. And he noticed on his bill, after a couple months, he, he would order like a, a pay-per-view or two a month. And he would look at his bill, and he's like, they're not charging me for these. And he's like, all right. And so then he kind of got a little... Over anxious on some of his pay-per-view orderings and, and started watching some of these things. And it was mostly like sporting events and movies and stuff like that. And, and it was after six months then he got the bill of everything. And he was like, ah, oh. he's like, man, this is painful. But, you know, got to do what you got to do. I did order it. And so someday the bill will come due for all of us. One day that'll happen to all of us. Um, and so since my voice is struggling a little bit this morning, I asked Jody if she would pop up here to help me with uh, scripture reading. And so I'm going to have her read a section out of Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 12. And this is going to kind of set the, the tone for uh, the rest of the day. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed, followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one, righteousness act, or one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. My wonderful wife, <clears throat> I sprung that on her this morning, like, hey, can you, can you throw me a bone here? So thank you. And so what this is saying here is sin is great, but 
grace is greater. We all have this disease. Part of it has to do with Adam and Eve. Their sin messed everything up for all of us. And so part of it is we sin because we're kind of genetically prone. Another way of saying it is our, our spiritually speaking, our, our <clears throat> we're out of alignment. Because of Adam's sin, that kind of knocked our, our, our willpower out of alignment, our ability not to sin. And so we naturally... Not, it doesn't make an excuse for it, but we are naturally inclined towards some sin. You don't have to teach a kid to lie. They figure it out on their own. And so those are just things that we, we have to deal with. And so don't miss this. Grace is greater than whatever word you want to put next to it. Um, I know for some of us, we've said, we've done, we've seen some nasty things uh, just, you know, even just through a phone. And like we mentioned, social media before. Um, maybe some we've made fun of somebody that we shouldn't have. Maybe we crossed the line. Maybe we've had a couple nights where we've had a little too much to drink. Uh, maybe we've put other illegal substances in our body that it's really embarrassing for, for some of our young people. Maybe we've disrespected our parents and uh, uh, maybe we've been a lazy parent as a parent. Maybe some have struggled with same-sex attraction thoughts and you think, man, God's grace just isn't for me. There's no way God will ever love me. Um, maybe some struggle with liking people that are different than them. Whatever it is, whatever it is, the struggle that you have, the different sin taste bud that you have, it doesn't matter. God's grace is still greater than your mistakes. And so luckily God's grace is what makes us right with God. And so when grace is taken out of the equation, not only do things turn toxic, they turn religious. Religion is not bigger than your mistakes. It's not something I, I care too much for, and I don't think Jesus did either. Being all religious, being trying to be better than, trying to be uh, appear holier than. If you don't believe me, check out Matthew 23. Jesus is just nailing these guys in what's called the, the seven woes with all these religious things that they tried to do to make themselves look better, to make other people look lower, to, to all these just terrible things that they did. I called them these whitewashed tombs, saying, you guys look nice on the outside, but on the inside, dry, rotting, nasty bones. And so religion is our attempt to earn God's favor by adhering to rules and regulations. And so translation there is, I can be good enough and better than somebody else. And so religion is not greater than your sin. And so following Jesus is not about being good enough. It's about that motivation that comes. Uh, we'll put this chart up here. Religion versus grace. Religion versus grace. Okay, the key word for religion is uh, do. Key word for grace is done. The focus for religion is, is outward. The focus for grace is inward. The foundation for religion is rules. Foundation for grace is relationship. Hey, there it is. Thank you, guys. Um, and so uh, then next is motivation, shame versus gratitude. Shame means you're controlled by being made to feel bad. I mean, is that something anybody wants to sign up for? Yeah, I'm here to, to be ashamed and to feel bad about everything about me. Um, obviously, there's people that, that operate that way versus gratitude, living in recognition of what's been done and it makes us want to be holy. Not that we have to, it's just that natural outworking. Uh, the feeling of fear and frustration versus freedom. I know for some, it, it's a real fear that, that some might not make it into heaven. Like, what if I'm caught in the act of a sin? Like, am I still going to make it in? Uh, dare I say God's grace might be bigger than that mistake, bigger than that sin. And so I'd rather live in the freedom of grace, which says that uh, free from the pressure to measure up, free from the pressure to be good enough, because it's been taken care of. Your bill has been paid. The outcome, pride and guilt versus love. You know, would you rather be in the, the pride of having to look at all the rule keeping, look how great I am, and then having to really beat yourself up when you do screw up and, and consider yourself less than? Or would you rather march out and live out love? We love because God first loved us. We experience amazing love, and that's a great foundation. So grace is absolutely greater than religion. 
It can only be explained so much. It can only be taught and talked about so much. Sometimes it's something that has to be experienced. I know the story of a dad and a kindergartner, and uh, this kindergartner kept coming home, and, and if you know, you know, nowadays in kindergarten, they have the color system, okay? If you had a good day, you're green. If you had an okay day, you slipped up once, you, you're on the yellow. If you had a bad day, red. And uh, I know of this kindergartner who kept getting on yellow, and, uh, and we, we, would, we would let that slide, maybe one yellow or so a week. But we had one week where there's two yellows. It's like Wednesday. It's just like, you listen up. We're sick and tired of seeing all these yellows. And so if you get another yellow, we're going to have a problem when you get home. So sure enough, another yellow happened that week. Okay, go to your room. Dad marched upstairs, stomping, gets into the room, looked at this kindergartner's face. He could see he was scared. He was intimidated. He wasn't looking forward to what was about to come. Dad had a board in his hand. He looked at this kid, saw the fear, the tears, the terror. He said, what'd I say? We had a deal, didn't we? You're getting grace today. We're going to spare you today. <laughs> it's an interesting face to explain that to a kindergartner. He said, well, we, we all need to do better, don't we? Yeah. And so it can only be talked about some, so much. I don't, I don't know. What, what, what we teach our kids at home on this idea of grace. But it's something I want my kids to know, to hear, to feel, to witness, and to have it lived out. <clears throat> Jesus never used this word. Paul does a lot. A guy named E.B. White said, Grace can be dissected like a frog, but the problem is it dies in the process. And after you're done, you, you got a dead frog. So I don't want to be a group of people that sit around and talk about grace and look at the scholarly implications and all these other things. No, I want to see it, feel it, live it out. Uh, and so uh, Jody's going to come back up here and we're going to take a look at a story in John chapter 8. And so even though Jesus doesn't use the word grace, we kind of see it lived out here in this story in John chapter 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again at the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So I don't know what the worst mistake that you've made. One that would, it would scare you if it got out. Whatever that mistake is, whatever that story is, God's grace is still greater than that mistake, than that story, than that mess that you made. And so this woman was brought out. Obviously, she's not the only one involved with this mistake. And Jesus writes in the dirt and he says, hey, you who are without sin, you have the first pitch. There's only one eligible person there that, that qualified for that. But I didn't see him picking up any stones to throw. And so what might have been the worst day of her life was about to become the best day of her life because in her brokenness, 
she found Jesus. And so God's grace is greater than your secrets. For some, you maybe needed to hear that. It's been something you've been hiding, maybe even that something that makes you sick to your stomach, gives you a headache, the stress, the embarrassment. Might need dragged out, kicking and screaming. Don't live with it. I don't mean to say let's make a public spectacle right here and now, but maybe talk to somebody. Uh, bring it into the light today. There's a book uh, by Frank Warren, and this was kind of a, a group art project. <clears throat> I don't recommend reading it, but uh, he's not related to Rick Warren or anything. But So what he did was they set up like stations for people to share some of their deepest, darkest secrets. And uh, some of these are silly. Some of these are absolutely heartbreaking. So uh, I'll read some of the, the lighthearted ones. I think of women who wear, women who don't wear makeup are lazy. Uh, women who wear capris scare me. <clears throat> when I'm mad at my husband, I put boogers in his soup. <laughs> Who's ready for lunch? <clears throat> when I get my pedicure, I want to kick the girl in the face. I hate when people include me in a group text. I give decaf to people who are mean to me. Better look out. I said some of these get a little more serious. Wish my dad could have forgiven me before he passed. I wish I was blind so I didn't have to see myself. I'm only happy when I buy things. Every time I eat, I feel like a failure. How do I tell my husband he's raising his best friend's kid? When I sleep with my spouse, I feel unfaithful to my lover. I haven't talked to my dad in 10 years and it kills me every day. Last one says, I've told all my secrets and now I feel free. But let me tell you, you are not free until you understand and accept and live out grace. Because grace, fortunately, is greater than your shame. Grace is greater than your mistakes. So like the woman in John chapter 8, many of us think, not after what I've done. I've done too much. I've seen too much. I've gone too far. I've wandered too far. Nothing could be more further from the truth. Come live in grace where you're free from con condemnation, shame, and death. That's one of the key words that, that a lot of people like to skip over out of John chapter 8. Is One of the last things Jesus says is, go leave your life of sin. We skip that part sometimes. So stop living in sin and shame. Some of it's our fault as a church. So sometimes people get a label and we make them wear that label for the rest of their life just because of one mistake. And so some of us, we struggle to, to live this out. And so sometimes it's not about the hurt or the sadness. Sometimes it's about the anger and the bitterness. Back to Hebrews 12. See to it no one falls short of the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So some of us have had to deal with an awful ex, a backstabbing uh, coworker, uh, a drunk driver, a former friend, somebody that owes you money. Um, and, and so sometimes we think, uh, I don't know if Grace is, is able to go far enough to forgive that person, but it is, it is. So your story isn't about that you were, you cheated or you were cheated on. Your story is about, uh, isn't about getting kicked out or reprimanded or let go. Your story is, is far from over, far from over on that. Matt Chandler told this story. He's a preacher down in Texas. He went to a Christian concert when he was in college. And they go to this concert, and, and they're having a great time. And they had a group of friends with them, and, and one of them was like a single mom who, I mean, to get a night out, it's a big deal. And so in the middle of this Christian concert, they had this uh, speaker kind of get up and give like a gospel kind of presentation. And he said, man, this guy got up there and... He was angry and he's up there and he's just, he's ranting and raving about purity and diseases and teenage pregnancy and, and just all these things and throwing statistics out there. 
He said, but before he started, he had this rose. And he said, hey, let me, let me pass this out. I want you guys to pass it around. Take a smell. Obviously, this is before 2020. And so they pass this rose all around in this concert. And this guy gets to the end of his talk. He says, oh, hey, um, where's my rose at? Let me see that rose. And he's like, yeah, I'll take that back. He takes his rose. And he holds up this just worn out, damaged rose. And he's just like, Pfft. Who would want this rose? See, when you, when you don't take God's word on purity seriously, this is, this is kind of what happens. I mean, who would want that rose? And Matt Chandler, sitting in the audience, like trying to control himself and contain himself, but he's sitting there in his head thinking, Jesus Christ would want that rose. Absolutely unapologetically. He who knew no sin became sin. Jesus Christ died for that rose. He would want that rose every day of the week. Jesus Christ wants that rose. And so some of us buy into the lie that Jesus came for the sick, not the healthy. And sometimes we miss that. Don't miss this. Hebrews 12, see to it that nobody falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. So there's a word to describe it and it's called grace. Ephesians 2, 8 says, for it is by grace that you have been saved. Not by good works. It's a gift from God. So that, that kind of enters into the, the age old debate. When are we saved? When, when have you accepted a gift? Have you ever thought about that? You know, when it's your birthday and somebody gives you a gift, when have you accepted the gift? You know, is it when you take the gift off of the table? Is it when you open the gift? Is it when you utilize the gift, enjoy the gift, write a thank you note for that gift? I don't know. But we at Community Christian believe that absolutely you are saved by grace. But we also believe there needs to be an accepting of that gift. And we believe that does absolutely happen in the waters of baptism. When we align ourselves with Jesus Christ, his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And so that's something we love to talk about, to receive this gift of Jesus. So don't miss this. Do not miss this. Because if we do, things get real toxic real quick. Thank you guys for hanging with me this morning. <laughs> and deal with me. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather and to hear from your word. And God, I know some of us, we feel just like that rose that's been beat up, torn up, mangled. But God, it, it doesn't matter. You still died for us. Grace is still for us. It doesn't matter. And for that, we are so thankful. And God, we love you. And we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week.